Hey everybody, welcome and thank you for being here. My name is Cordelia Blake and I'm here to help you guys learn more about e-commerce, how to sell on Amazon and just business in general. Today, I'm super excited to announce our guest, Michelle Covey from the GS1, um, which she's gonna tell us a little bit about what she does. And then we're gonna talk about UPC codes and GTIN exemptions and GTIN codes and what all that stuff means. Um, this information is really relevant to people that are developing products, people that are bundling products and creating new products out of them, and people that are selling on multiple platforms because different platforms have different requirements. And then also, if you want to sell your product like in an actual store, that also is relevant. So thank you so much for tuning in and let us get started. <laughs> Michelle, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about like what the GS1 is and what your role is there? Sure. So first of all, I'm Michelle Covey. Um, the role I lead at GS1 US is really just helping our members, anybody who comes to us to license an identifier, um, understand how to use it, whether it's on the retail side, a marketplace, if you're a seller or a listing um, agent. Um, so I'm just here to help people kind of work through all of our, our standards and understand them, kind of boil them down into layman's term, I guess. Um, our standards can be very complicated. Um, I work for a company called GS1 US. We are, um, we are a standards organization. Um, we are part of the larger network of GS1 um, member organizations. Um, so we are governed by GS1 Global Office. Um, there are many other GS1 offices around the world. So they serve the region that they're in. So say like uh, GS1 Brazil, GS1 UK, GS1 France. Um, they all serve that particular market, providing services um, to that region, usually in that native language, time zone, that sort of thing. So each GS1 office um, runs uh, independently. Actually, we have our own, um, our own business model, but we all um, follow the global standards. We administer the global standards, and we take that global standard and then uh, apply it to um, our local region. So some, there may be some differences, um, but we, we work with our members in our, in our region um, to help understand the, how those um, standards can be applicable to in-region uh, trading requirements. Okay, great. So um, Michelle reached out or her team reached out because they have a new product, which is so great. I wish it had been around when I did my first private label product because my first very, my private label, I was like, this is going to go huge. Let me buy 100 UPC codes. And that was $750. <laughs> and I ended up that wasn't a brand I continued. So I, I used three of them. And then that was the end of that. So um, this is such a great product. So can you tell us about this new product you guys just launched last year, the $30 GTIN it's called? What is that? Sure, let's start with, a, uh, with what we call a GTIN, G-T-I-N. It stands for the Global Trade Item Number. And most people recognize it as the barcode that you see on your products when you go, that go beep at the, at the retail store. It's really, but it's, the barcode is actually the data carrier that carries that number, mm -hmm. that GTIN. Um, it's the number that uniquely identifies that trade item for sale. Um, so it's usually, it's, it's kind of like the product's own social security number. Or right. of sorts to help it um, uniquely identify that product. Um, so the the G10 that we um, or the offering that we launched in um, last November is the single G10. Um, so if you've been familiar with GS1 US's offerings in the past, we used to offer them in bundles. So um, you know we used to offer them uh, in ten hundred. 1,000 capacity, 10,000, it's usually under a prefix, and then um, a, a member could come to us and then enumerate their, their GTINs off of that capacity. What we we're finding, similar to your scenario, is after we've done some research and um, market research talking to a lot of those small businesses trying to launch their products, um, they only needed one or two. And it, it just as you're starting your own business, it could be uh, a barrier to entry to buy just that bundle. So we launched the single G10 offering um, in hopes that that would help sellers, you know, just get those get themselves started in, you know, launching a product and then see where their product, um, where their business um, grows, and then they could come back for more. Okay, so the, there's a lot of letters that say things, GTIN, UPC, and then, of course, on Amazon world, we have the ASIN, which is the Amazon using unique identifier. 
So the GS1 codes, if you get a code from the GS1 directly, um, it's considered to be a universal code because it can be validated. So an independent company like Amazon or really anyone can actually sort of check that number and then it will show up in the GS1 as your company and your widget. Whereas if you go to say some of the places where you can buy valid UPC codes like on eBay or whatever, those codes are not valid with the GS1. They are not real codes and they cannot be validated. And so Amazon now, if you put in a, G a GS1 code, if you put in a barcode, they will validate it against the GS1 database and ping you if it's not a real code. Not every marketplace does that yet. Walmart is not doing that yet. They are request, they require UPC codes, but they aren't validating them. But that could change any day now. So is there a difference? Because I noticed you called this $30. And the nice thing about the $30 code too is there's no renewal fee. Correct. So when you buy like a bundle of 10 or 100 codes, you know, you pay a certain amount the first year, and then you have to pay every year after that forever, as long as you're using that code. Whereas a $30 code, you pay it up front, and then boom, you're done. You never have to pay for it again. But is there a difference between that $30 G TIN or G10 and like a traditional UPC number? Are those the same thing? Or are they different? Okay, so you you unpack. There's a lot to unpack in what you just yes. said. So let's, start, <laughs> let's start with the actual codes. Um, so a GTIN, that global trade item number, um, it, it can be referred to as barcodes, it can be referred to as a UPC, it can be referred to as an okay. EAN. Um, so really what that, that global trade item number is, that GTIN, is the, the number that identifies the product. In the U.S. market, traditionally for many years, it's been also the UPC, which is actually a 12-digit GTIN. So okay. we've called it a, a, um, a UPC. For many years in the European market or other places around the globe, it's usually been the, uh, the EAN, which is the 13 digit. Okay. They're both a type of GTIN. So when you say a GTIN, it could be a UPC, it could be an EAN. So they are they are they are kind of the same thing. They're just um, one's 13 digit, one's 12 digit. It's based on where the market the market um, usage and where they were administered. So traditionally, um, the GS1 US um, administration of those GTINs have been the 12 digit UPC. The UPC has been what's been used in the US market for many years. However, these are globally unique item numbers. So they should be and are um, uh, uh, recognized globally. So I could use my 12 digit UPC in a European market and vice versa, the EAN can be used in the, the US market. Um, it's you know just some people feel like they have to use one because they're in a certain region, but they are globally unique items and they could be um, recognized around the globe. So hopefully that that kind of clarifies what a GTIN is and the usage across um, across you know across regions. Um, we as GS1 uh, member organizations all report all of those um, those global item numbers, trade item numbers, GTINs into um, a database that says. Michelle um, was licensed this particular G10. Um, this is her company. So that database is used by many retailers around the world and marketplaces around the world to validate that I am the true owner of that G10. And it was administered by a GS1 member organization. So you are correct. Um, if you are using um, or selling on a platform that does that validation, then they will they will do like a, a quick uh, kind of validation to make sure that I am the true owner of that that identifier, whether it's that bundled prefix or if it's the single identifier. Yes, that Michelle does have the, the licensee ownership to that particular identifier. If not, sometimes your listings get blocked. Right. Um, if you do get your um, barcodes from other sellers that are not a GS1 um, organization, those don't get reported into the GS1 database. And so you run a risk for if you're selling with a, a trading partner that does do that validation, that they won't it won't become a valid, you mm -hmm. won't have that validation check and you won't pass that validation check. And they may not uh, allow you to, to list on their platform or sell within their, their uh, trading environment. Right. So, um, so a UBC is a type of GTIN. 
Correct. So there's no real functional difference if you get the $30 code or like a say you got a pack of 100. The, the codes are the, basically the same codes. It's just how many you buy. Is that right? Or right. Just, is that? So the, yeah. So the, the bundle offering, we um, lump it into a what we call a, a GS1 company prefix. And then from there, based on the capacity that you licensed, you could create 10, a hundred, a thousand um, GTINs from that. So it's just, it's it, we allow you to do it in, in a bundled fashion. Um, we at GS1 US, we have a tool called the Data Hub tool that um, takes the logic out of it um, so that any, you don't need to know how to, to create it and do the check digit. You go into Data Hub, it's a, it comes with your membership, it allows you to create all the GTINs off of that bundle. And then you can you know, go ahead and then start to use them in market. Um, if you only, like I said, if you only need one, we'll just administer you that one G10. So, so they're um, the same, they are the same codes. So it sounds like though, if I'm hearing, so a prefix, what, what happens when you sign up for a bundle, because I did this, is you know, they say, okay, your first four digits or six digits, I think it is, is one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. And every product that starts with one, two, three, four, five, six is Cordelia's product. Yep. And then you can have product A, product B, and then those, the unique part is the numbers after the first prefix, right? So if you get the 30 digit, I'm sorry, if you get the $30 code, it's not going to have like your company prefix. It's just going to be a random code that's unique, the end, right? It's just any random number. Yeah, we, we issue them all, um, at random off of our mm -hmm. own like uh, off of reserve prefixes that we can use um, to market those. Um, but that G10, so into, in its entirety, is still associated to your company. So we could associate okay. the prefix to your company, or if you've come to us and licensed that single G10, we will associate that single full string of G10 to your company. So let's just say that we, let's say that we decide, okay, you know what? I know I could buy a pack of 10 for $250, but then I have to renew it every year and think about it. I'm just going to buy 10 for $30 each and pay 300 and then boom, I'm done. Would those 10 that you bought at $30 each be in any way connected to each other? Like, or they would just each want to have its own listing with your company name? Yeah, like I said, we administer them from internally reserved um, uh, prefixes at random. We don't want okay. anybody to figure out our logic and then go right. and then, like, so we do them at random. Um, okay. And so, but but again, they it's really just that item's social security number. So so if you bought thirty, if you bought ten, sorry, if you bought ten of the thirty dollar one, and looked up each individual code though, it would always say Cordelia's company, Cordelia's yep. company on each one. It just wouldn't have any kind of numerical thing in common. Correct. Okay. Um, and then is it, for, I don't know if I'm saying this, it's the Geeper or Jeeper? Okay. No. Right? I've heard, right? I've heard it all different ways. Um, we call it Gapier. Um, oh, Gapier, okay. <laughs> That's the database where you look up like companies, right? And you look up like a code and see who it belongs to. Yeah, that's the most common tool. If you go out to um, whether you go on the GS1 US site or if you even go to the GS1 global site, um, the tool, the Gapier tool, you could enter in the G10 and then it'll return who is who the company that's associated to it. Okay. Um, there are some additional tools and NGS1 um, is uh, innovating, um, trying to make that a little bit easier to use and, and having um, putting some technology behind that. So uh, there'll be APIs and other search capabilities. Um, GS1 US in particular has our data hub tool where you could actually search it in, in mass and get an API connection into all the prefixes um, or licenses. And is that what Amazon does? They plug into the API probably, right? The Amazon marketplace? They do. Okay, we had a question about that, okay. But it's, it's that Gapier data. Okay. And I mean, it's it's available to everybody. So they, they use that data for also for the, um, for all uh, prefixes used around the, the globe. Or okay. The globe. 
So that brings me to my question about global G10s. Mm -hmm. um, so you can buy a, a bundle of, of UPC codes or G10s like in the UK GS1 website for a hundred pounds for the first year. And then it's a hundred pounds every year after that, which is about 140 US dollars. That's significantly less expensive than the US codes. Now, do they work the same? If I buy the UK codes and plug them in to Amazon.com, is it going to be the same issue, same experience? Again, um, so those codes, they're globally unique. So coming out of GS1 UK, you will um, receive EAN codes, the 13 digit codes. Um, okay. But again, they're global trade item numbers that are accepted everywhere. Um, and it's like I mentioned earlier, each GS1 um, regional office runs independently, so they have a different business model. Um, what we see is most people want in-country, in-language support, so their, their help desk may be, you know, offer um, a specific service. They might have some other bundled offerings with it. Um, each member organization has their, their own business model. But if you're based in the U.S., and you want to sell in the U.S., you can still buy from another. You can still buy your codes anywhere around the world, and they are because they're global identifiers. They would still be validated on the Gapier database, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, there are no no real rules on which GS1 member organization you go to. Okay. And because a lot of there's a lot of sellers globally that want to sell in the US and they're based all over the world because we have our Americans love to buy stuff. <laughs> so we buy more stuff than anyone in the world, apparently. And so everybody wants to sell in our marketplace. Um, are there any like search engine optimization or Google type benefits from getting an official um, code, a GTIN code? So um, you kind of referred to it at the very beginning. So a lot of sellers you know, they'll they'll start to list their product, get their product launched on a marketplace like Amazon, because it's really easy to get something going. Um, one of the things that if you start to think about where you want to um, expand your business, maybe you want to put it on another marketplace, trade with another retailer, whether it's a brick and mortar or another marketplace, um, you don't have to renumber your num your product. Um, if you sell into those, you can use your G G10. Um, and then that G10, especially if you're listing on a, a, an e-commerce site, um, what Google does is it takes all of that data and um, uses machine learning and aggregates that G10 data. So, you know, if you go and search for something, Michelle's, you know, cup, and it will aggregate all that data based on that G10. So if you're using that G10, then you can see all of the, um, the sellers who are selling that particular G10, and they're using that, that G10 as that data aggregation key. So it, is, it does help with search engine optimization, helps with um, search, um, helps your product be uniquely identified across any platform because you have that single identifier. Okay. It reduces confusion. Right, absolutely. Um, now, some people, they, so, some people I know, they sell thousands and thousands and thousands of items um, and they're testing them all the time a lot. Now, print on demand is becoming very big. So, you know, people will make a picture of an apple and then they'll throw it on 500 different products and see which one sells. <laughs> so the people I know who do that, it, they're, they're mostly using bootleg uh, UPC codes because it's just really expensive for them to get real ones and they don't even know which thing is really going to sell. Is there any kind of like mass, like we're short of, I guess you'd have to buy an enterprise level subscription to UGS1 to just get like a huge quantity of your own codes that are valid? Yeah, our recommendation is any product that you want in market should be uniquely identified. So if you mm -hmm. look at our T10 management rules, so you would want to have each variation uniquely identified. So if you do launch a thousand different variations, you would want to assign a thousand different G10s. Um, and the rules state if you do launch it in market, it exists out there and it could exist forever. Um, and so if you change, so you decide that blue apple is not going to sell, you're going to reuse that code. Um, the recommendation is to not reuse those codes, even though you've already assigned it and it's not going to sell because it may already exist out there. And then you could have that collision of those G10s um, in search engines, that sort of thing. So um, the recommendation is you would need a unique identifier for each product, 
that you bring to market. Right. And even if you discontinue it, don't reuse that, that code. Start over with a new one. So let's just, that kind of brings me to another question. So once you've set up your code, you know, you say this is Mich uh, this is Michelle's cup, <laughs> right? And it's Michelle's company, and it's this code. Um, and so you sell your cup, and then you can't get them anymore. They run out. The supply chain breaks down, and you're done. So then you you have a uh, spoon that you want to sell. Michelle wants to sell a spoon. Is there any way to go into the database and change that record from being a cup to being a spoon? Um. We don't, at least if you look at the data hub tool, we don't, again, we don't recommend it. it. It does not, it goes against our G10 management rules. Again, our cup was in market, even if it was discontinued, it could end up on another platform as a resold item. Um, okay. And then they'll ask for the original G10. So again, um, I would have to reassign or assign a new G10 to that spoon. Now, a lot of really big companies do this. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, where they'll take a, let's just say our cup example, and they assign a G10 to it, and it's on the GS1 database, and they'll say, okay, this is Michelle's cup, and then they sell that for a year, and then that thing's discontinued, and then they come out with a different cup. That's maybe the first one was orange and this one's going to be pink now. And they just reuse the same code. It happens like we see this because when we list products on Amazon that have codes on it, we're like, oh, this says it's a pink cup and it's really an orange cup. I guess you're not supposed to do that. But really, if it's a cup, right, if you just put in the product as cup, that's kind of against the rules. But it's not like you're going to get nothing Nobody's going to come down and hunt you down or anything like that, right? No, there's there's no G10 police. <laughs> there are no G10 police uh, <laughs> that I know of out there. Um, you know, it's just we put out the G10 management guidelines. Yeah. Um, and different retail trading partners may take them and you know administer them and you know I guess you know kind of police them themselves. Um, we just give guidance to industry. Here's okay. what you should do. Um, and then we always state that our standards are voluntary, not mandatory. So, all right. Well, um, we had a, a bunch of questions from our community, which I've been, I think I've included all of them. <laughs> um, do we? Do you have any? I guess any other points that you wanted to make, or anything else that you wanted to mention before we wrap up? I think you know. There's always advice that I, I've heard from many sellers over the years. You know, I'm launching my product, and especially if I, I'll use Amazon as an example, um, I could get a G10 exemption. Why would I want to get a G10? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it might be good to start off and you could um, launch your product without that G10. But we always say, think about where your product's um, going to go if you want to grow your business. Um, repackaging and relabeling is, is very expensive. So, um, and we've seen it a couple of times in different instances where they'll sell, they won't get a G10, then they decide to um, sell into um, another trading partner, and then they have to put the G10 on their product. And then they actually then have to repackage everything because now that, that new trading partner will, will require that, that that G10 along with the barcode is on their product so that they can scan it um, for you know receiving at the warehouse and, and point of sale at their store. So um, just think about where you want your product to be sold and how you think your product will grow. Because um, if you choose the G10 exemption up front and decide not to, it could cost more in the long run with repackaging. So just kind of those are the things to think about. Um, also for those sellers who do assign a G10, but then don't put a barcode on it because they're they might be doing fulfilled by Amazon and Amazon does not unfortunately use the, the GS1 barcode right. for the receiving, they have their own FN SKU. Um, but again, so you don't choose to put that barcode on your product, um, that data carry that, that holds that G10 information, but then again, you sell into another retailer, again, you'll have to repackage. So just some things to think about um, as you kind of launch your product and where you want to see your product grow, um, who you want to trade with, understand those other, you know, who are your desired trading partners, understand what their requirements are so that you can keep that in mind when you um, launch your product and then see where your business grows. Yeah. And the other thing I would add to that is, um, you know, I've seen people over the years, you know, I've been selling online now for eight years now. And at the beginning, it was very much like the Wild West, right? Like anybody, you just throw any number up there and they take it. <laughs> like, but the problem is 
that, you know, later, if you, if that product does want to become a more official product, then you're stuck with this code, whatever code you put into Amazon, if you use one of your, your bootleg codes, Amazon will not let you change the EIN, EAN or GTI. They won't let you change it. So if you put in a UPC code that's wrong, that's, that's not a legit one, you can't then go back and say, hey, can you please update the GTIN to this really good one from GS1? <laughs> they don't let you do that. I mean, I've heard of a few people being able to do it, but it's really hard and they don't like doing it. So it's really important, I think, that you either get an exemption so you have nothing on it or you use an official legit code. Because um, the other thing that happened on Amazon, and I think it's reasonable to extrapolate that this will happen to other major marketplaces. Originally, Amazon said, hey, we want you to have a GS1 code on your product, but they never validated it. So we could still put in whatever the heck number we wanted and they would never check it. Well, guess what happened one day? One day they connected to the Gapier database and they flicked the switch and they didn't say, hey, tomorrow we're flicking the switch. They just flicked the switch one day and then a whole bunch of sellers got caught with their pants down because they knew that they what they were supposed to do, but they didn't do it. So I hear, especially with people that are wanting to expand to Walmart, which is a growing marketplace, Currently, as of the last time I talked to people selling in Walmart, Walmart's not validating. But any day that switch could flick. And if you're using not legit codes, all your listings are going to get shut down. And as and same globally, you know, like so it's just going to keep happening as e-commerce continues to grow that the systems are going to do a better job of communicating with each other because it's a really good way to prevent counterfeit and thievery and all these other things that are also kind of plaguing e-commerce. So I think it's a great product, the $30 code, because it really does make it accessible to pretty much any business to be able to spend an extra 30 bucks to launch their product is like, it's almost like, it's almost free, really. If you can't afford to spend 30 bucks, you shouldn't be selling online. So, um, so I think it's a great idea. I'm really glad you guys did it. And I'm so grateful that you reached out to me to share it with us and, and share it with our community. So thank you. Of course. Yeah. And uh, if you have any questions about some of our standards and, and you know, what is a GTN, how do you construct it? Um, we've created quite a few um, short, quick little YouTube videos. If you go to our GS1 US um, YouTube channel, okay. um, they're usually two to three minutes, but they give kind of a little short reason of why you would want to use it or here's what a G10 is or how it's used in a in a marketplace or um, a retail trading um, uh, location. So um, hopefully a lot of um, short but informative informa videos out there for you, your community to also check out. Awesome. So in the comments below, I am going to put a link to the $30 uh, GTN signup page, and I'll put a link to their YouTube channel as well. And um, of course, you can always find me online. I'm super easy to find because I'm too dumb to come with 20 different <laughs> identities. So you just put my name up and there I am. I'm like, I can't, I can't outsmart anyone. So, and um, we have contact information for the GS1 and Michelle will put in the contacts below with, um, so that's all gonna be available to you guys. And as always, I'm gonna do that same thing every YouTuber does. Please like my video, please subscribe to my channel and please hit the little bell so you'll get notified. I try to do new videos every week that are educational to Amazon sellers and e-commerce business owners. So please tune in. Thank you so much for being here, Michelle. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Bye everybody.